Hello everyone and welcome to this event today which is presented by Black Cultural Archives in partnership with the Sickle Cell Society. I am so delighted to present this event in partnership with Sickle Cell Society today. My name is Arika Oka, I'm the Managing Director of Black Cultural Archives. Black Cultural Archives is the home of Black British history. We use our mission to collect, preserve and celebrate the histories of people of African and Caribbean descent in the UK to inspire and give strength to individuals, communities and society. So we, our venue is One Winter Square in Brixton in London. We are closed under COVID restrictions at that venue at the moment. But obviously the work of our charity continues online with events such as these. When our building opens again, we run a series of gallery exhibitions, educational programs and public engagement events there. And with there in person, you also have free access to our unique set of archives, objects and our reference library. The Sickle Cell Society is the only national charity in the UK that supports and represents people affected by a sickle cell disorder to improve their overall quality of life. Its 40th anniversary was in 2019. To mark this anniversary, the Society has been recording stories and sorting its archives, culminating uh, in the exhibition, which is hosted online by Black Cultural Archives, which you can see on our special exhibitions website, BCA Exhibits. And you can also see it in person when One Windrush Square, our venue, reopens in late May. To open this celebration of the Sickle Cell Society's work, I will be in conversation with Dame Elizabeth Anionwu, and then followed, uh, following that conversation, Alimta Sara, who is the Sickle Cell Society project manager, will be in conversation with some of the people featured in the exhibition and who worked on the project. Dame Elizabeth Anionwu is a British nurse, healthcare administrator, lecturer, and is Emeritus Professor of Nursing at the University of West London. In 1979, she became the, UK, uh, the UK's first sickle cell and thalassemia nurse specialist, helping to establish the Brent Sickle Cell and Thalassemia Counselling Centre with consultant haematologist Dr. Brozovic. In 1998, by then a professor of nursing, she created the Mary Seacole Centre for Nursing Practice at the University of West London. She's a PhD, has numerous, numerous awards and honours, and she was appointed a Dame Commander of the British Empire and is also a Fellow of the Royal College of Nursing. So now I want to welcome Dame Annie Onru to the live stream. And here we are, Dame, Dame welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much, Erica. Please call me Elizabeth. Elizabeth, Thanks. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. How are you today? I'm extremely well. I've had my walk. It was a bit windy this morning, but uh, I survived it. Thank you. I hope you're all right. Thank you. I'm, I am. I'm good. Mm -hmm. And so we're going out live on YouTube at the moment. So if anyone's watching on the YouTube stream, feel free to put questions in the chat, which I think is to this side of your screen if you're watching from home. And we will ask Dame, uh, sorry, Elizabeth, we'll ask Elizabeth the questions towards the end of our conversation. Um, so I wanted to start our conversation, if you don't mind, with you telling us a bit more about what sickle cell is yes certainly sickle cell anemia is one of the types of sickle cell disease or sickle cell disorders it's an inherited blood disorder affecting hemoglobin which is the red protein inside the blood cells mm -hmm. and it, it has to be inherited from both parents to actually have the illness those parents don't necessarily have to have the illness each of them must carry and pass on one, what we call gene for sickle cell. So commonly, most parents of an affected child have what's called sickle cell trait or are a healthy carrier. Every time they have a child, there's a one in four chance that each of their children, there's one in four, some people term it 25%, every time they have a child. So that, for example, if they had 10 children, let's say, all 10 children could inherit the illness or none of those children could inherit it. Some of them could inherit sickle cell trait, the usual haemoglobin, no sickle at all, or sickle cell anemia. So literally it's a matter of chance. It is like throwing the dice, the pair of dice. So 
a child born with the illness, and I'm sure we'll hear more about from those who are affected, such as I, I know Laurel is, is, in, is contributing this afternoon, which is great. So they don't actually get any symptoms until at least after the age of four or six months of age. And even then, it's a very individualistic illness. It can vary between siblings. It can vary even within the individual, as, as we will hear. So they might be very badly affected for a period of time and then have a respite. Uh, or, or they may be constantly affected or hardly ever affected. It, it is such a variable condition. And the common problems are severe, mild, but to severe, excruciatingly severe episodes of pain, often called the painful crisis. Anemia, so obviously tiredness, and the susceptibility to infections such as pneumonia. Now, there are actually a lot of other complications that virtually affect any organ in the body. But rather than give a long list of things, I, I, I thought maybe just talk about the main um, problems. Thank you. Um, my nephew actually is a, has, has the trait, but he's not, um, he's not ill. Uh, so I wanted to know what inspired you to get involved as a sickle cell nurse? Because that wasn't the first type of nursing that you, that you did. No, that's right, Arika. I was originally a health visitor in Brent in the 1970s. And that's actually when I first came across the condition with a, a, a mother of a young son who had the illness. And whilst she was reasonably happy about his medical care, she was a bit frustrated because she didn't have all the information she needed as a mother to look after him at home, but also to see if she could prevent some of the problems from occurring. I actually met my father for the first time in 1972 when I was in my early 20s. And uh, through meeting my family, discovered I had a cousin with the illness. So it became much closer uh, uh, and personal. And I often say my interest in sickle cell anemia can be explained by the three P's, personal, so personal family involvement, um, professional, so obviously meeting individuals like Laurel and Brent, and political, because I, I was really interested in black health issues. And many of us saw that this wasn't receiving the same attention as it should, considering the numbers of people affected, the severity of the condition at times, and the, the public health as well as the personal um, impact that this was having. And uh, yet there the, the just wasn't the adequate resources um, being put into the condition. So yeah, it, uh, those, were, those were the reasons that I and many others uh, realized we needed to work together to lobby uh, and, and mm -hmm. be, be activists actually in supporting yeah. those affected by the illness. Okay, well, I really want to dig deeper into health activism. But first, I think, thank you so much for telling us a bit more about the context of sickle cell. Um, I'd really like to learn a bit more about you as well and to share a bit more about you with everyone who's watching and who will watch this later on the YouTube channel too. Um, I think your story is fascinating. And I, I'm really also fascinated about your identity as a black woman and your identity as a, a, having Nigerian heritage as well. Could you tell us a bit more about your story and how you self-identify? Yes, certainly. I was the outcome of an affair between my mother, who was of Irish heritage living in Britain, an affair while she was a second year student at Cambridge University where she met my father who was virtually about to complete his law degree. They never got married. My mother was a single parent and she dropped out of college. It was a, we have to think this is just after the Second World War. Right. And uh, whilst mixed race children and adults are much, much, much more commonly seen in society, in British society today, that wasn't really the case just after the Second World War. So we hear a lot about intersectionality, don't we, mm. uh, at the moment? And uh, when I sort of started to understand what it actually meant, I realized my, <laughs> my, my, my mother's story, my own story, actually imbued, Im, imbued a lot of those aspects. So for example, the, my mother wasn't married. 
Um, uh, she was originally from a working class Irish heritage family. Uh, I, I was mixed race. Um, and and so t t the, the, the shame that right. was bestowed upon her and that she felt was due to all of those factors. Oh, oh by the way, she was Catholic. You know, you bring in religion, etc. And where, where my mother was different, it was that she forcibly rejected the idea that I should be adopted. And, right. Um, okay. she, it, it was very difficult for her to look after me. And I, I had lots of different movements within my the first 16, 16 years of my life. I was in a children's home until I was nine. My mother never, ever rejected me. And she was always a constant presence in my life, despite the difficulties. And I think that's definitely one of the reasons that I turned out all right, if you like. And I <laughs> I achieved what I did and I'm a happy person uh, but there are obviously challenges because when I went to live with her and my stepfather uh, from the age of nine to nearly 11 it didn't work out because my stepfather started to physically abuse me because he was being teased about having a half caste child wow. talking, okay. talking about the 1950s so we have to right. remember what what was the terminology for individuals like myself sure. and it was very negative it was seemed mm -hmm. as you know, we 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 weren't um, pure. You know, all this rubbish. But it, it obviously affected individuals like myself to know that the only difference that I could see between my friends and myself was the colour of my skin. But the negative aspects of that brown skin was such that I washed my face ten times as wow. a child to try and become white. So I think that that's really pretty that's it's such a vivid and why why should a child want to do that and it yeah it obviously affects their sense of identity however however you know my grandparents looked after me as a teenager and I then mm -hmm. started nursing and you know I got into black identity issues really after I completed my nursing course at the age of 21 22 because I realized oh, that there's, there's something more to my identity and I need to meet black people for a start, yeah. but also find my father, which I did at 22. And that really transformed my life. So, you know, I obviously love my mother and my Irish heritage family, but I needed to know my Nigerian family. And it turned sure. out beautifully that I did find my father very quickly as well. So I, there's, there's so much in that, I think. One one thing I wonder wh whether that is part of the roots of your activist identity as well, because there are, there are many nurses actually who would not have taken up the mantle of championing sickle cell and making it better known and ensuring that research was being done into sickle cell and ensuring that families had the support. So it is activism. And I wonder whether some of your experiences growing up contributed to activism. And there's also, I, I also am of mixed race Nigerian heritage. And so for me, I fa always find it really inspiring to see you, for example, going to accept your damehood in Nigerian dress. I think that's just wonderful to see you represent Nigerian culture in that way. Um, and, and obviously being a nurse as well is, is an identity in and of itself because your nursing identity, um, from what you said, grew before you connected with your black identity um so i'm not sure what the question is sorry but i i'm really interested in how these different identities kind of played out into making you who you are and how it they all kind of contributed i think equally perhaps contributed to your work on sickle cell well i worked it out eventually as as an adult <laughs> what drove me actually when i read President Obama's first autobiography, Dreams from My Father, because he talked about recognizing that he had deep seated anger. In it. it took him a long time to realize he had a lot of anger in his belly, deep down, if you like. And, and it was like, you know, a light bulb moment. I thought, yeah, I, I've grown up with deep seated anger. And, you know, we, we're, we're socialized not to show our anger, mm. uh, well, you know, on the whole. And and also also my skin color and my father nobody ever talked about it. I grew up in a, as I said totally white society institutionalized till, till the age of nine, and then with love a lot of loving people around me by the way, 
but nobody talked about, you know, as I say, the elephant in the room, the skin color, my father. And as a child, you know, if nobody talks about something, you don't bring it up. You right. sense that, you sense that there's there's a reason for it, but it really impacts on you. And I, I, you know, I really wish that adults would be aware of what is gnawing inside children that they mm -hmm. don't always articulate. Fortunately, reading black writers, um, for example, Franz Fanon, Black right. Skin, White Masks, was mm -hmm. uh, recommended to me when I was in, I was in France. I was uh, 21, 22. And I told a, a, a French black woman who was a, a, an activist about washing my face 10 times. She said, ah, this is the book you need to read. Ah, okay. Of course, of course, Franz Fanon talks about the impact of colonialism, neocolonialism on making a significant number of brown, black skinned individuals in colonial countries and the aftermath feel negative about their skin color mm -hmm. because actually the people in power don't look like them, therefore think there's something wrong with, and they're also the way they're treated, of course. So I was very fortunate to have people signpost me to literature and to activism as well. I, I, I would mention, for example, um, Jessica Huntley. Right. Who, the, late Jess, the, the late Jessica Huntley yeah. now, of course, who, who established uh, Bogle Overture Publications, Walter Rodney Publications in the end. Because I used to volunteer. Uh, it was a way of any, reading black literature free because I wasn't very <laughs> well off at those in, the, in those days. And also uh, volunteering and going to loads and loads of... Uh, event just just watching the program that was on recently I think it was just last week mm -hmm. about black British resistance it the, uh, last night the one no wait what well, day is it Saturday couple, couple on Thursday. Thursday on Thursday that's right oh yeah. it brought a huge amount of memories you know I saw a glimpse of Jessica sitting on the front row at the, the big meeting I think it was in Conway Hall um, when activist um, Stokely Carmichael from the States was speaking and then I saw John LaRose, uh, 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 who had the first black publishing company, um, New Beacon Books, I think it was called. And I saw him in the background with the demonstrations. Um, I can't remember totally, but the, 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 and I, I thought, wow, at last, you know, significant program telling us about our own black British history. Yeah, Absolutely. And yeah. I think that was... Uh, executive produced or produced by Steve McQueen as well, who recently yeah. had the Small Axe series right. on yeah. the BBC. So, I, I, mm. and and of course, all of those all of those people, as as you know, were part of the the collective movement that birthed BCA, <laughs> Black Cultural oh, Archives. Um, I just remember what what the demonstration was about. It was uh -huh. the tragic. Uh, deaths of 13 young people in the New Cross fire. Right, um, it's the 40th. 13, 13, 13 dead, nothing, and nothing said was, sure. was the, 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 the... So, yes, um, that for me was me growing up in the... Seven, well, not growing up, I was in my 20s then, but in the, in the 1970s. 1970s is a particularly important period for Black British history as that program Definitely. demonstrated I think. Mm. So the New Cross fire that was 40 years ago this January yes. um, and then that led to the Black People's Day of Action which was right. Huge beginning mark. of March 40 years ago as well mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. this is also the year that, that BCA dates its conceptual genesis to mm -hmm. 1981 mm -hmm. again so yeah this this kind of what, what, what I feel what, what, we're kind of talking about and, and starting to approach is that despite your story, in some ways, it's quite a lonely story, that beginning of being the only person of colour, the only black person um, in your family and in your kind of close peer network. And then suddenly you are introduced to this world of activism, but also that kind of network of people who you can learn from and 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 vibe with, I suppose. Um, do you feel that that was something how how your how you decided to focus on sickle cell is is really what I'm kind of coming towards? Yes. Yeah, so the 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 the, the 
the triggers, as I said, were personal, political, and professional. The the, the child with the mother who was desperate for information in my in the early seventies. There mm -hmm. was the um, my growing interest in black health issues that that went through the nineteen seventies, and um, and then you know finding my Nigerian family and realizing you know I had sickle cell in in the family, but also having the opportunity. Oops, sorry. <laughs> These things fall out. Live easy. broadcast. Yes. <laughs> um, also, I I realize I I realized that the, I could learn a lot about black political issues, black issues really, by going to the United States. And uh, I went in the early seventies, but then I went back again in the, the mid to late seventies quite a few times, particularly to learn more about sickle cell because there was, there, was, there was no information in this country. There really wasn't. There was a few haematologists and pediatricians who were interested, but they themselves were struggling to get support from their colleagues and, and what was the Department of Health at the time. So in the United States, car, you know, the 70s in the States was, well, I know the 60s, but the 70s were also very, that's where, that was my university going out to the States, right. to be quite honest. It really was wonderful because people, were so keen to share their experiences. Also quite surprised that there was a significant black presence in 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 Britain because mm, I, I, I you know I've I've now got my afro back due to lockdown. But um, <laughs> in the 70s it was actually bigger than this. And obviously there weren't any grey or white hairs at that time. It was really black. <laughs> and so you can imagine I had this huge afro. And before I opened my mouth, people would assume in the States that I was an African Afro Afro-American. African American. Now, I open my mouth and they just stop me. What you, from England? <laughs> what they, are you? <laughs> they, they, they just, you know, they love the accent and <laughs> and they hadn't. Most of them had not met any black British individuals mm. before. And so, I do think that is a, that's 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 quite. Uh, I I feel like there's 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 still that um, overwhelming sense that black history is an African American history, even in the UK. And so that's, you know, that's something that we're hoping to correct. And certainly that the Sickle Cell Society, uh, exhibition is, is hoping to correct to really keep that sense of education going. Definitely. I think it's a lot of laziness historically within schools. <laughs> they find it so much easier just to copy and paste what's what, what's available on on the internet and it's it is african-american uh, on the whole rather than again you know why did we just see this program just a couple of days ago we should have had these programs you know decades ago we, we've got such a vibrant and interesting history about the black presence in britain which of course goes back as, you know, thousands of years thousands. Exactly, I mean, exactly. It's the, exactly so <laughs> the history you know, of the world is be, a global history we should be having so many more it, i mean it should be embedded in a whole array of programs in the and uh, the media uh it, which it isn't yet so uh I hope, I hope the penny's dropping somewhere in the media i think yeah. i well, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, Steve McQueen has now been able to 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 rise to a level That's in true. which he can force the penny to drop, and we have yeah. people like David Olusoga who again yes. can force yes. the penny to drop. So you yes. know, as ever, don't worry, guys, we'll do it ourselves. <laughs> but, um, before I go to some questions that are coming in from other people, I am going to continue being quite selfish for a few more minutes because I want to talk to you a little bit about your relationship with nursing now and your relationship with the NHS and your journey through that because I, I find talking to you that you have such reserves of, of, of empathy and curiosity actually you know intellectual curiosity about other people's experiences and I and um do, do you how did you get started in nursing? What inspired you to be a nurse? Is is it is it because you because of your empathetic nature, perhaps? Yes. Well, first of all, I am actually one year older than the National Health Service. I'm very proud of that. Actually, <laughs> uh, and the reason you is really look I, like <laughs> not. Oh, oh not listen. To um, say that. <laughs> there, there's something going on. My if anybody wants to look on my Twitter account at the moment, I, I I've joined. I joined in the sort of you know these hashtags something about you don't look your age i can't remember what it is now but um, you definitely don't look so, so i put that I'm, people people are putting their ages on in their images so i put i'm 70 oh my goodness no no it's really started something but anyway so i'm saying that in a sense because the national health service is so significant for all our lives mm -hmm. and uh the reason i wanted decided 
to be a nurse, I think from the age of about four or five, was when I was living in the children's home and I had very, very bad eczema. And various nuns used to change the dressings that I used to have. And most, I don't think deliberately, but most would hurt me when they mm. took off the bandage a bit brusquely. But there was one particular nun, and I used to call her the white nun. Well, all the nuns were white, but she used to wear a white habit. And she used to joke with me. She used to wear, used to words like bottom. Well, you know, those of us are brought up in a very strict Catholic <laughs> upbringing, which I was in a convent with nuns. Uh, I, I was so shocked. You know, this nun used the word bottom. I thought that was so rude. <laughs> of course, I burst out laughing. What, what had she done while I was laughing? Take the dressing off. Mm. I didn't feel a thing. And I just adored that 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 nun. I really did. And, and then I learned that she was something called a nurse as well. And I decided that that's what I wanted to be. So I think it can show how influential adults can be in determining our career pathway. Certainly Absolutely. that was the case with me. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Fabulous. Okay. So actually I do want to go to one of the questions that someone has written um, as, because, because it's so relevant to what you just said, as a, as the first sickle cell nurse in the UK, how do you feel the care in sickle cell changed from the seventies and what challenges still exist in care for people living with sickle cell? So I, I think that's kind of relevant because of, um, you know, what you were saying about the empathy that nurses show, but also, you know, what we've been discussing about the awareness in the NHS even about sickle cell. Well, there's been revolutionary change, thank goodness, in respect to um, sickle cell on the National Health Service agenda, because that's where you need to look. Because if it's not on their agenda, it doesn't get allocated resources, et cetera, et cetera. So there's been a huge improvement. So, for example, every newborn baby in this country is screened for sickle cell, regardless of ethnic origin. The, the, the that's amazing. Has been, that's that's the, the, a huge change. Yeah, an important lesson has been learnt by the National Health Service. It took a long time for the penny to drop again, but that sickle cell does not just affect black people. It's an inherited condition, and the links go back to where falciparum malaria originated. And if you are a, a silent carrier of sickle cell trait, so you don't have the illness, but you can pass on the gene. If you have sickle cell trait, as a young child under the age of two, living in an area with falciparum malaria, you have partial protection against that quite serious illness. So that's that's the sort of origins of the condition. Now, it, it, malaria occurs in countries where people have white skin, brown skin, black skin. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not to do with the skin color. So the, the, the fact that it was a long, hard battle to argue for what's called universal newborn screening. As I said, screening regardless of ethnic origin. And that allows the diagnosis of a child with the illness to happen really early. And the parents can be advised, the health professionals are aware, treatment can be instigated much earlier. And we know that this prevents deaths. And we know that this can prevent certain um, deterioration. It, it can't obviously can't t take away the illness, but it prevent can prevent a lot of problems. And then the other thing you flagged up was about nursing in in terms of how things have improved, but what still needs to be done. A lot of us have been arguing that actually every nurse should be taught about sickle cell systematically in their nurse education, their three year program, for example. Now the um, nursing and midwifery council. I, I, I have, have agreed that that is that is important now. I, I obviously with COVID, I'm a bit out of touch with what's going on. I it'd be interesting if we could get any feedback. If there are any student nurses or nurse educators or anybody who knows about this, do 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 they know yet whether this has been implemented? Because it really is out, outrageous that a student nurse could complete a three year program in this country and not and leave it and not heard been given any information about sickle cell so whilst there's been huge improvements it still shows you that it's still not the, yeah. accorded the priority it should be accorded so how do you keep i mean because it's it's tiring then right you've made such incredible progress how do you keep going with health activism are you still active oh. in health activism and 
Who are the uh, other um, campaigners that we should know about? I think you need to look at the Sickle Cell Society because a few of us were involved in getting it set up 40 years ago, as you, as you mentioned. Okay. Uh, but if you look at the staff, it's very few staff. I mean, we really need to put, give them a pat on the back, particularly John James OBE, who is the chief exec of that uh, charity. It's a national charity that's really punching above its weight in terms of uh, the resources, as I've said, it, it really does need. It's a, it, uh, I, get, I get cross when I think that it, 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 there is some support, but not, not sufficiently, because that's the, that's the main charity in this country that has to lobby for improved services. It also provides support, as, as with any national charity for any condition, can imagine the range of activities that it undertakes. So uh, that, is, that is the sort of key organisation that I would say keeps an eye on the health service, but also right. listens to what are the current needs of those affected by the condition. Absolutely. So what, what can we, so beyond those people who are work, Sickle Cell Society and, and, and people associated who are actively working on the issue, what can everyone else do to raise awareness of Sickle Cell? And, well, and also all, Sickle Cell Society. Yes. Well, first of all, now we have Google. I mean, people can go on the internet and just on, on the Sickle Cell Society website, for example, you can watch a short video. You can listen to individuals' mm -hmm. experience of living with the condition. That Those resources were just not available 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I think, and, and those resources are free of charge. So actually, I'm getting old and grotty, so, you know. But, <laughs> There's no reason for people not to be aware. If, as long as they know, you can go online and you can find this information. Just, just Google, just log in sickle cell. You can yeah. get information in the UK, but you can also get global information from the United States, etc. There's a wealth of information out there now. So that's the first thing individuals should do: make use of the resources that are available to teach themselves. Then, if they want to take it a step further, they should think about: okay, in my life, maybe I'm a professional or something. Are you a teacher? Are you are you obviously in the health service? Uh, do you have some resources? You know, here's a charity that really could do with support. Even everybody on the whole has something. It might be they've got friends. They might not have any money. They might not be in a profession that they feel would be of help. But they've got friends, and they themselves can actually teach themselves and then teach somebody else about it. Exactly. We shouldn't feel helpless about what we can do. We start with ourselves and then we sort of ripple out according to our circumstances and our networks. Perfect. Um, I am trying, while you've been speaking, I've been trying, I've been reckoning, I'm trying to remember the fiction book that came out a few years ago. Do you know which one I mean? It was a, a story about a Nigerian family of sickle cell. And it, I think it was shortlisted for the Welcome Book Prize. Oh yeah, I do. I can't remember the name. Okay. I, I, this when, is, when we finish our chat, I'll. I'll this Google is the it issue with can... age, Harry Kay. My my, my <laughs> memory is oh, really I can't bad. remember. But I, I know I know the book. It was actually. But you do. Uh, it has a green cover, right? Yeah, I've got okay, it. I've anyway, got it. Oh, it's on my Kindle. Yeah. But yeah, that book. Remember. When I read it, it just made me like really sob, and mm. I think there's something to be said about popular culture as well in, yes. in, 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 in communicating like health messages um, and, and education. Well, the impact, um, sorry to interrupt you, but the no, impact fine, go ahead. when there was a story on EastEnders, for example, right. you know, it, it, you know, things like, yeah. as you said, it just reaches a huge amount without feeling people have been preached at. It's part of life today. So it should feature in, in uh, narratives and, and media coverage. Yes, I, I agree. So someone has just put in the chat, um, oh, it's Ayobami Adebayo, stay, stay with, with me. Stay with me, excellent. Thank oh, you, Grace, for having the chat. As we feel like, we can't remember what it is, it was great. Um, but talking about books, I believe you, were, you, you felt comfortable in sharing a bit of a scoop with us today. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tell, so, us, tell uh, us what we've people, got to look forward to. Okay, so a few people might know that I actually self-published my memoirs in the, towards the end of 2016. Mm -hmm. a, a publisher has come along, Orion Publishers, Seven Dials uh, imprint, uh, and they're bringing out in September a, a revised, updated. I mean, it's it's all 
it's, it's, it's really good, I can tell you, because it's still working on updating it. And uh, it, it's, 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 it's been fantastic to both self-publish and just know what it's like to be in control of your own publication. It's quite interesting. But also, though, to see the difference when you have a mainstream publisher like Orion uh, approach you and, and bring the resources and the guidance and the interest and the expertise to you because obviously if it, particularly this year we were working in we're all on our own aren't we a lot of us so um, and so uh it's going to come out in september and it's actually got a new title it's going to be called dreams from my mother you oh, might beautiful. recognize a little bit of where that might have come from dreams from my mother and it as i said it will be uh it's only going to be about seven pounds something so and also there'll be an audio book which i will oh be. wow are you narrating I'll the be audio narrating book of your memoirs? Well. Fantastic. Yeah, so it's very, very exciting for me because it will obviously reach a, a much bigger audience. The platform yeah. that a, pub a mainstream publisher can offer is, is incredible. And, I, 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 you know, I am delighted because I, I am aware how helpful people have found knowing about my life and yeah. the fact that it started in a very difficult way, but that I've managed to achieve what I have managed to achieve and my my life history is is very similar to a lot of other people's you know we all face with challenges we're all faced with racism we're all faced with absolute ignorance of people who believe you know to be British you have to be white excuse me you know um so I think uh I, I yeah that's really really exciting opportunity to to see that book go mainstream yeah in September I can see someone who's watching the YouTube uh, stream says, looking forward to the book. Oh, so yes, I think it sounds like you sold one <laughs> already. <laughs> well, I hope that you will allow BCA to celebrate that launch when it comes oh, towards the end be, of this I'd year. Be very we honest. would love to. Okay. We would love okay. to. And I'm really, really excited about it. Um, I want to have a look because there's been quite a few uh, questions coming through. So if you just give me a sec, I, I think one that's come through, which I think is really uh, timely to talk about um, is, and I quote, you've done such important work on combating racial healthcare disparities in the NHS. And in this COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen a disproportionate impact on black British communities. What do you think is the root of this? Racism. Very, very straightforward, very straightforward answer. I mean, what COVID-19 uh, literally pulled the window open. Because some some people, you know, we have got allies, so let's not be negative. There, there, there have been organisations and individuals, and, and I think allies is the term that's often used now, who who have, ha, have witnessed, have understood what people of colour experience. Mm -hmm. Because it it isn't it it is not just up to those that experience it to 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 get something done about it. It's society itself. So all those in, important um, organs and organisations and influencers, whatever we want to call them, politicians, you know, uh, they they should be addressing this issue in a much greater way. And it hasn't been addressed. And what COVID has shown, in, in the sense that it's not just uh, discrimination hasn't just affected their quality of life, um, the, the sort of housing they get, the education they get, the employment they get. It's actually caused them death. It's caused yeah, the death of it's individuals. Fatal. This is this is awful. Yeah, we knew we know that racism has caused death. We we can see it in maternal mortality figures. Mm -hmm. We can see it in all sorts of uh, statistics. But actually, COVID has really just thrust its head above the parapet and said. Yeah, there's absolutely. a spotlight, right? Yeah. It's like yeah. okay, this so, is this is the consequence. So it has caused yeah. a lot of debate, and it's caused a bit more action. I think I, I would agree with people who, who have, I mean, I've witnessed it. There's been much more discussed about it because it's in your face. What are you going to do about it? Sure. And also, when you think it's also made people realise that so many um, black health professionals are on the front line. They, they've been exposed to high viral load of COVID-19. Well, those of us who know about the NHS and its history know that black and brown doctors, nurses, midwives, porters, the, the, all the staff that are involved with the National Health Service, running the National Health Service, such a huge proportion are 
black and brown individuals. Sure. So what, could you tell me a bit more then about your experience of being a black individual in your career in the health service? Do you feel that your ethnicity changed, do you feel like your ethnicity gave you a different experience to people who were um, present as yes. white? Yes, uh, right from the outset at the age of 16, applying to three teaching hospitals um, in London, I was in the Midlands, and I had seven O levels, which for those younger people, <laughs> Uh, it was quite good to have some low levels, you know, and 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 yet, when I applied to the, the, all the teaching hospitals at, at that time, they don't know. They wanted a photograph of me. They wanted to know who my father was and what his occupation was. Right. Oh come on, those are three. You know, I, mean, I yeah. couldn't give any. Inf I couldn't give that information. So these are as, those 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 individuals. And how is that aware. relevant at all to becoming a? Yeah. Nurse? <laughs> and and those relevant. people who know about recruitment policies would just say, "How or, today?" What? You know, you just don't do that because you see where the barriers are. Mm -hmm. So I was very naive, 16 year old. I, I, I didn't know why I wasn't getting any response, etc. And it took a, it took a, a, a medical officer of health who saw something in me, who was who got quite angry at this lack of response, and actually signposted me to a, a hospital that he had contacts with. You see, so. Um, so you I, had to I, have an intervention, basically. Yes, looking Sorry. back, I, yeah. we call it mentors now, wouldn't we, and, and, and things like that. So, yeah, so right from the outset, I've I've realised, and the, uh, a variety of issues that I've had. For example, I was failed as a health visitor student. Now, I'd done extremely well in my theoretical nine-month period. I got top marks, and I was doing very well in my placement. The supervisor thought I was great, marking me great. But I, d I dared to challenge the ridiculous way they were collecting statistics on what was called people from the new Commonwealth. And uh, I, I just, I, as a student health visitor, you see, if, sometimes if you ask too many questions, you get into trouble, but hey ho. I was, going around with a, I was going around with a fair number of health visitors and they were really pleasant and they were explaining to me. But I realized they were all collecting different, they were collecting the statistics in a different way. Now I'm a real nerd, I'm really logical. <laughs> And I just said, well, hold on, why, why, what is this? What are you collecting? So one health visitor was like, oh, it's, it's people with funny names. Seriously, we're collecting people. Oh, Lord. <laughs> or people who look like you, people who look like you, dear. Okay. Um, you know, there was the, only the odd one who knew what the Commonwealth was, you know. So that made me really... Oh, my gosh. And, and, and so I, they were I, like, oh, I've got to collect stats about the new Commonwealth. Yeah. Oh, how am I going to tell who that but is? But to be fair to those health visitors, if they'd been asked to collect this, there should have been some guidance given to them about what, what on earth they, they, they were supposed to be doing. And why were they doing it as well? Because student health visitor, when I asked the health visitors, they were, I say they were all very pleasant. But it got to the ears of the, my manager, well, my supervisor, that I was asking all these questions, and she failed me. She actually failed me because she said, "You haven't, you haven't got the right attitude to become a health visitor." Because what? Now, fortunately, <laughs> an interest in patient fortunate, care. <laughs> fortunately for me, I was actually then I was saying twenty-two or something. Very interesting part. I was in the Labour Party at the time. I was also in an, a, a group called Needle, which was a sort of radical health group, students oh, and okay. literally yeah. to needle the health service to do better. <laughs> And I was also involved with black community organizations. So I mentioned it to all of them. Woof! They all said, ah, this isn't on Elizabeth. And they all rallied <laughs> round. And so, so soon this threat of failure was kicked out the window. But it actually showed me how when we're struggling and facing discrimination and facing yeah. you know, challenges that are, that are not correct, if you have this group around you, wow, what a difference it makes. Yeah. You're not fighting these battles on your own. I do feel that, that that was a kind of a theme that we were discussing at the beginning, right? When I was questioning, you know, how lonely you might have felt mm -hmm. and then yeah. you became part of this network of activism, which doesn't necessarily mean um, that it has to be very radical or left wing or whatever or extreme, but it's actual, you know, people actively supporting and pushing things forward and not allowing inequalities and 
uh, and things like that to take place. And, and, and also, I, that sometimes it, it sounds all very serious and earnest. And I, I tell you something, <laughs> I had great fun. I mean, you meet wonderful right. people. You know, you go out, you socialize. It's 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 that's that was an un, that was a surprising aspect that I learned. You know, it great fun and 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 again within the black community groups and working with Jessica, etc. Yes, it was hard hard work at times, and you were challenged by racists at times. Sure. But that that sort of collaborate sense that you got was really, right. really good and, yeah. and collegiate, right? Like yes. and, and just yeah. supportive, and that's yeah. I think what people really need when there's find themselves in those kind of situations is to know that there is support out there and that there are mm. people who have gone through the same things as you. I don't know if you're aware, because I know you're retired and, and yeah, thank, thank you so much for everything you've done before you retired. But I don't know if you're aware of any contemporary networks that, that people working in healthcare or health activism um, should be aware of. Well, there's one that I just love their name. It's, they're called Melanin <laughs> Melanin Medics, isn't that what? Okay. Isn't that what it's always, <laughs> it just it just says. Love, so, yeah, yeah, there there are, and I, I pick this up through Twitter, and obviously I'm aware of some nursing groups as well. So yeah, I, I, it, we've got different medias through which you know platforms, I should say, that people can. Uh, get, and obviously, during this last year, I've seen how important social media and other uh, examples like that can be to avoid a isolation but also to focus on current issues such as obviously COVID-19 and its impact on 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 the black community uh, that is actually you know it's a, it's an extremely sad example but it's actually a very important example and I think historians will look particularly people interested in in history of the black community and and how they respond the what the way it was picked up relatively quickly within the black community. Well, obviously they were seeing their friends and relatives ill and dying from this condition. And it, yeah. the, the, the first, you know, the, the first doctors uh, that died were all from black and minority backgrounds. So right. it, it, it was pretty difficult to avoid, to be quite honest. Yeah. So um, before we end, I am really inspired by your phrase, sickle to sickle. And I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about, about what that means. Yes. Well, I, I was, I've often been asked to give talks about like campaigning life and things like that. And, you know, you, 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 you have to give a title to your talk. And I, I, I like playing with words, I, I must admit. And I thought hold on, you know, I'm talking about Sickle and then I'm talking about Mary Sickle. So Sickle was the early part of my career and I'm still, I'm a patron of the Sickle Cell Society. I'm very honoured with that. Uh, but more recently worked with others to campaign for the statue of Mary Sickle. So yeah, what about that Sickle to Sickle? Yeah, it's got a nice ring to it, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and tell us more about the Mary Sickle statue campaign. I mean, some people might not know my beloved Mary Seacole. <laughs> well, it took the, the the key thing was that it took nearly thirteen years for a group of campaigners. It was led by Lord Clive Soley, uh, the Mary Seacole Memorial Statue Appeal, and he uh, invited a few of us to join as trustees. And then it, there, there was a there was a real cascade of support from the community from all all, all backgrounds, but particularly the fact that she was. Um, she was the, there wasn't a statue of a black woman in this country. I mean, let, let's just, let's put the cards on the table. So it attracted a lot of support. A, there's very few statues of women and obviously even less of black women. So that, you know, I, I wanted to be involved with the campaigners because how closely I resonated with what Mary Seacole stood for. She was mixed race. She was Jamaican Scottish. She was a feisty woman. She wouldn't let anybody to stand in her way. She was born in Jamaica. She died in, in London and was buried in London. And uh, she was of the time of Florence Nightingale. And as many nurses would tell you, quite rightly, we're taught about Florence Nightingale. Don't, don't, you know. We should be taught about get, Mary Seacole as well. You know, She's an absolute yeah, but, hero. You know, for those of us interested in history, we, we want to know about the key figures at that era and it was Florence Nightingale and Mary Seacole so how come we were never taught about Mary Seacole well we know why uh, anyway so uh, I think um, for many reasons a lot of us joined forces with this idea and it seemed a huge challenge to start with yeah. 
three quarters of a million pounds. Wow. But you see, it was done. It was done. And uh, if nobody's seen it, if you haven't seen it, go down when you can to the gardens of St. Thomas's Hospital in, in, in Westminster. It's the most beautiful, beautiful memorial statue. Uh, and it's outside. So, you, you know, you just stand there and look at it. It's, it's, it's magnificent. It really She's is. She's an absolute yeah. superhero. And the pose of the statue with yes. her... Uh, her dress kind of flying behind her it's like a yes. superhero pose as well mm -hmm. so thank you so much for sharing that um i wanted to um we're going to finish our chat in a second uh before we finish i wanted to make sure that we had referenced jessica huntley and mm -hmm. so if people want to find out more about eric and jessica huntley their archive collection is at london metropolitan archives um, and also to mention that black cultural archives is running a new project to catalog our archives of black mental health and black mental health activism this summer which is supported by the welcome trust so we are trying to do our bit in documenting the history of black activism generally, but also black health activism. And I am so really genuinely delighted to have been able to have this conversation with you, Dave Elizabeth. Thank, oh, thank you so you much. much. It's been very enjoyable, thank you. Thank you. We're gonna hand back over to Alinta now, who's gonna tell us more about the exhibition and the project, and we'll see some of the people involved as well. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank Dave you, Elizabeth. I can't just say Thank Elizabeth. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Arike. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, it was really nice. So, uh, well, first and foremost, I would like really to thank the Black Cultural Archive for uh, hosting the exhibition online and uh, collaborate with us, uh, especially during uh, the pandemic. Um, just to uh, give you a bit more context, my name is uh, Alinta. Uh, I am the project uh, lead for the heritage project at the Sickle Cell Society. Um, just to give you a bit of background about the Sickle Cell Society, I'm just going to quickly present um, the heritage uh, project and what uh, it is um, about. If I can now, if it's working. Just one minute. So uh, just before, uh, there seems to be a, a problem. So the Heritage Project is a project that's been uh, funded by the uh, HLF, the Heritage Lottery Fund. And uh, it's about tracing the history of sickle cell in the UK from 1950 to uh, nowadays. Uh, why this project was important, because as uh, Arike mentioned earlier, is that the uh, uh, in 2019, uh, the Sickle Cell Society celebrated the 40th uh, anniversary. And then in the, because of this anniversary, they've been uh, granting the fund to trace the history uh, of sickle cell uh, in the UK. Because uh, although sickle cell it's, um, is a uh, common is a genetic uh, disease is still there's still lack of awareness around sickle cell and part of the project was to uh, was or is to interview people to interview uh, patients uh, healthcare workers and to grasp a sense of uh, this uh, history uh, one of the outcome of the project was also to uh, do this exhibition and to exhibit uh, the, our findings, if you want, at the uh, uh, Black uh, Cultural Archive to also establish um, the first uh, Sickle Cell Society archives at the Welcome Collection uh, to produce a film and also uh, to um, uh, be able to do workshop with young people with sickle cell to, though, to promote more awareness about sickle cell and to also empower those uh, young people. So that was the project, and that's what we did. We collected almost 32 uh, interviews. Uh, we are still collecting more uh, with patients, healthcare workers, like, uh, uh, you know, family of, uh, of patients. And those interviews informed us of how we wanted to uh, construct uh, the, uh, the exhibition. So uh, before uh, I uh, carry on, I just wanted to show you the, the uh, actual um, exhibition. So uh, if you go on the 
um, a BCA website, you will have uh, the the uh, exhibition, the uh, the exhibitions, which is our journey, our story, the history and memory of sickle cell anemia uh, in Britain in 1950 to uh, nowadays, uh, and we've. Uh, uh, um, divided the exhibition in uh, three sections, and that was also informed by our uh, uh, by the interview that we've uh, actually collected. So the first part of the exhibition is "Living with Sickle Cell: Challenging," where we talked about the uh, the work of uh, the voluntary sectors, so the Sickle Cell Society, Oscar, uh, and uh, other. Uh, prominent people that actually took part to uh, raise more awareness about sickle cell. We talked about the issue about sickle cell and race, uh, the false perception of sickle cell being a black uh, disease. Uh, and then the last part, which was expressing, which was really important uh, in this exhibition, because it talks about how you express sickle cell throughout, how you can visualize it. And uh, we, I was, we were fortunate when we did the interview to find out that a lot of our sickle cell patients uh, actually were also artists. Uh, and uh, I also, uh, we also asked uh, um, Larry Aponsa, who is an uh, artist, a black artist, to uh, we commissioned him to do some work around the uh, exhibition. Uh, the exhibition. So the exhibition uh, is looking at the history, uh, at the campaigning, at the experience through all histories and uh, images. Uh, this exhibition was uh, co-curated, so uh, myself and also with uh, Grace Redhead, which is our project uh, consultant. Uh, so I'm just going to invite Grace uh, to talk. If she's coming and to present her herself. So Grace Redhead is, uh, is our project uh, consultant and uh, also uh, you know, yeah, I'll consult on the project. Hi, thank you so much. Yeah, so I'm Grace Redhead, um, co-curator with Alinta, um, and I did my PhD um, at the University, the University College London on the history of sickle cell in Britain. Um, and I think, as Alinta said, uh, with the exhibition, we really tried to respond to the messages and the themes that came up in the interviews um, that we've done. And I think if there are the, the key messages of it are that the treatment and experience of sickle cell in the NHS has been shaped by racism, but also that people with sickle cell and um, sort of healthcare campaigning healthcare professionals really carved out a space for care and resilience in the NHS and in their own lives. And that like a, a massive amount of really inspiring work has been done. Um, and also, though this project was based with the Sickle Cell Society, it's important to say that there are other organisations as well that did really important work and still do really important work, like advocating for people with sickle cell disease, um, particularly thinking of Oscar and their branches all over the country in Birmingham, for example, and other organisations like SCAR, run by Garth Crooks. So we were keen to represent that in the exhibition as well. And the BCA's collections have been really important and helpful for us to do that. Yeah. So before I uh, invite uh, the other uh, guests, so some of the people that we, interviews, uh, we interviewed for the exhibition, I just would like to acknowledge uh, some of the people that were part of the project or contributed to the exhibition. Uh, actually, the, all the people that we interviewed contributed to the exhibition because they helped us to actually try to organize uh, our thought around the exhibition. But uh, especially, I would like to uh, acknowledge the contribution of uh, Ajay uh, Datani, who is the chair uh, of uh, Oscar Birmingham, uh, Richard Patching, uh, who uh, is a uh, husband of Carol Patching, uh, who has a sickle cell, uh, Lauren Eldley, who talk about her grandmother, uh, Dr. Lola Oni, uh, Professor Simon Dyson and uh, the artist Larry uh, Aponsa. So I really would like to uh, thank them for their uh, wonderful uh, contribution and to trust them with uh, their stories uh, also. Uh, also. Uh, so before, uh, it was important for us to, uh, with the exhibition, to raise awareness by making visible the voice of those with, who live with sickle cell 
Uh, and that's why today uh, we're going to be in conversation with uh, three of the contributors. Uh, so Jenica uh, Lee, who is a youth mentor and works for Oscar Bir uh, Birmingham. So Oscar is a, the other charity uh, who uh, um, raise awareness uh, and provide support for people with sickle cell. Uh, we also have June Okoshi, who is a, a NHS uh, worker, manager, if I say, may say, and a photographer, uh, mentor, uh, youth mentor. She also a sickle cell advocate and uh, supports uh, the sickle cell society. And finally, uh, Laura Brumer, uh, a designer, an artist, uh, but also a sickle cell uh, advocate. And she worked uh, alongside or, uh, uh, Elizabeth, Professor Dam Elizabeth Anyangu. So we would like uh, you to, to welcome you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. So uh, I'm just going to ask you uh, first, and probably I will go start with uh, Laurel uh, about uh, maybe commenting uh, about the, uh, exhibi uh, the exhibition. So I know there was a special uh, uh, artwork, if you want, or image from the exhibition that uh, you wanted to talk about, uh, you know, to start, and uh, maybe we can start this conversation about what was uh, 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 living with sickle cell back, uh, if I can say back in the day. <laughs> uh, so I'll just show the, quickly uh, show the uh, the image. Uh, if you can all see my screen. So uh, it's not, this one, but it's up there, the uh, actual uh, sickle cell anima, who cares? And uh, you actually design uh, this image. The, um, yes, hi everybody. Um, thank you so much for giving me this amazing opportunity um, to be on this um, conversation with Elizabeth Anionu. Um, yes, this image, it's more than one image. It's two images, it was four images that I completed for the Sickle Cell Society in 1983, between 1983 and 1985. And um, just even looking at the image now and realizing that I have the opportunity today to be on this platform is amazing. It's, it's a, a fantastic opportunity but it's also a chance for me to, um, one of the images that I've actually submitted for this exhibition is a pencil drawing with my face in different, um, yeah, this drawing. And that was done, and to be quite honest, it's just a, a picture that depicts reflection. And I think that is what I personally am all about, living with sickle cell disease. I reflect a lot. And part of that reflection takes me back to the 1970s, to the 1980s, when I grew up, when things were extremely difficult. If I have to compare then to now, uh, the words would be incredible. The words would be amazing. The words would be fantastic. You know, and also it makes me reflect on how we also need to be grateful and thankful for the improvements that happen within society. I'm not saying that things are not, you know, where they should be, but I will say that we have come so, so far. My, my imagery that was used in this book, um, the, the main word that I can really say was horrendous. That little girl sitting on that chair with her head down, with tears falling from her eyes, was my life constantly growing up. I, 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 there was nothing that I could do in my life that did not consist of going to the hospital, that did not consist of experiencing pain that can be it cannot be described with words, and that's the reason why a lot of the time I put my experience in art in my drawings, 
in communicating with people and it's important you know i'm so so happy that this exhibition actually is available and especially that so you know sometimes things happen and we don't realize that things happen and they're actually a blessing in disguise because if it wasn't for covid this wouldn't be an online exhibition can you imagine the amount of people that have the opportunity to see this exhibition they would have had to physically go to see the exhibition, but they don't, they can see it with, within their home. You know, I'm thankful for where I've come from and where I am today. And I will always be an advocate for sickle cell disease. You know, the Sickle Cell Society has provided me personally with so much support. That's what I have to say first and foremost, so much support from the beginning to today. And I think that it's important for us to recognize that there is things out there. There is people out there. There is support out there. We have to actually go and find those things. You know, even social media, social media wasn't around in my days. Now, there is so much support on social media. There is so much support on platforms where, you know, you, you don't you don't have to feel alone because you're not really alone. Not a hundred percent. You'll never. I, I think somebody who suffers from sickle cell disease will never. There's there's a part of you that that you always know nobody can touch because it's it's your personal part that is a part of you that is just something that you a part of you that you can't explain to people. But the one thing is that an exhibition like this being able to express yourself jenica for example with your with your books and i also you know i also am a self-published um author and i've got work coming out soon but you know to be able to do things where you can express yourself to people truly express in a way where people maybe would not understand otherwise because it's easy to look at things to see things, to hear things, to be told things, but to fully, fully understand where a person is coming from. Unless you experience that, you'll never know. And I think through imagery, through imagery, through blogs, through telling people what you've been through, you know, I, I just believe that I, you know, I'm I'm just really happy. I'm I'm a really happy sickle cell patient. Yeah, I really am because I know where we have come from. And I think that we've got a long way to go, but I, I believe we're going to. One point I'd, li I'd like to make though, yeah, is that within one of my imagery, I think within the imagery used in that book, and there's a few more, I still notice the tablets that are on its side falling out. We still can't get free prescriptions. That's one thing that I think is really ridiculous that we need to change. Okay, thank you. Well, that brings me to the next questions, uh, because you mentioned that there are things that people wouldn't know. So uh, maybe Janika and June, why would you like pe people to know uh, what it is to live with sickle cell? What would you like people to, to know about living with sickle cell? Um, maybe I can start with Janika. Um, the question was, what would you like people to know? Uh, yeah, what about living, what is what is living with sickle cell. I think for me, uh, and more more recently as well, I've something that I always think is important for people to know about sickle cell is not the the general um, description that you'll get if you type in what is sickle cell into Google or if you go to an event and someone's explaining what sickle cell is and how it affects people. Because I think. Yes, sickle cell is a condition that affects our blood and it causes a lot of pain, which is, you know, something that is often focused on. But the different variation of complications that can occur as a result of living with sickle cell is something that I think more people should know about. And just the fact that how these, these complications can be missed, they can also be overlooked somewhat as well. I think it's important to 
for, for patients like myself, someone growing up living with sickle cell, I didn't know all of the things that could potentially happen. And I've experienced quite a number of complications, you know, things such as strokes that can occur, um, they're more, more likely to occur in children. Um, a, a vascular necrosis, which can affect your joints, your shoulders, your hips. Um, eye problems that can cause blindness, liver complications, long-term organ damage. All of these things are, if we, if we think about it logically, and the fact that sickle cell can be a life-threatening and fatal conditions, a lot of the time those fatalities occur because of one of these complications. It's not just because it was so painful, it's because the effects of the lack of oxygen or the impacts of sickle cell that has on the blood causes these complications, which then leads on to, you know, fatalities. So I think that is something that I, you know, often like to talk more on and often like people to know. Um, there's a lot more, more to it, even with the treatments that people go through, blood exchanges every four to six weeks, um, taking tablets, which are, you know, quite frankly, mild forms of chemo. All of these things are things that we, are living and have to experience that not a lot of people are aware of um so i i particularly would would shine the light on on those things yeah june yeah i i think um to be fair laurel and janika have said a lot of the things that we really need to shine a light on but i think what for me the most important aspect of sickle cell that maybe people who are not aware of the disease might always tend to misinterpret is the fact that it's inv invincible. Um, the fact that it's human beings do not connect with what they can't see or what they can't understand. And therefore, how can they show empathy when you've got your two hands and you've got your two legs and you've got, you can see and you can use all your senses and um, it's difficult for people to then empathize or show compassion whether it's your healthcare professionals or your friends or society or your employers um, and, and it's interesting because you you go into a and e with a broken arm or a broken leg or you have your cast on and you go anywhere in society and people go oh my god what happened I'm sorry you know because people can see that you have a cast on and they can see that people know what it feels like to have a broken bone and therefore they can empathize or connect with you or your pain or your suffering um and, and it's it's very it's still quite a big barrier for people with sickle cell and and just picking up picking up on what Janika said it's all of those things in that we have to deal with with the disease but yet people can't see that like how how can people see when you're in crisis and in pain if they're not there with you in hospital how can they see that you're having organ complications or you know your hip is not right because you've got a vascular necrosis or you're sickling every day and or, or how can people understand pain if they don't feel it and i think for me that's been one of the biggest almost it's almost like an epiphany I had in my 20s like why why is sickle cell so understated and I think trying to raise awareness in very different mediums and using different approaches as well and trying to change our narrative a little bit more is what I would want people to know about sickle um so a question for all three of you um, is what do you think that people with sickle cell disease need to live their best lives and, and reach their full potential? What are the kind of, what are the things that, that, that we need to put in place that, that needs to be put in place in order for that to happen? Um, should we go to Laurel first and then Jenica and then June? Um, when you say what things do you think um, should be put put in place. I don't I don't quite understand what you're meaning because the way that I view sickle cell is that although it's a genetic disorder and you know somebody can have SS, somebody can have SC, I think 
it also is an individual, it, it affects the individual slightly different. Everybody is affected differently. I know of, um, I know of, I have friends that didn't have their first crisis until they were 18 years old. Um, so they, they had never heard, I'm talking about, you know, obviously when I grew up in my generation, um, and my, my experience of sickle cell, you know, I was diagnosed at three years old and I was constantly hospitalized from three years old until I went on blood transfusion at the, at the age of 12. And then I was on blood transfusion for like 30 something years. And then now I'm on hydroxyurea. So, I mean, it was what worked for me. It, the, the treatment that I got was what worked for me, but what works for me might not work for another person. I think the important thing, the most important thing is, um, June, June touched on it. If people don't understand, no matter what is put in place, things can be put in place, but if people don't actually understand, then I don't know what can really be put in place 100% that's going to be effective. I don't know. Maybe June and Jenica have got, you know, better thoughts than what I have. But to me, I think maybe because uh, the way I've, dealt with my sickle cell has helped me as an individual. And, and to be quite honest, I think the thing that has really, really helped, helped me is people like June, people like Jenica, people like this platform that has made me feel like I'm not alone. I have people that I can turn to. I have people that I can speak to. I have, because the medication and the treatment for everybody is such an individual an individual thing but look I work for a school and they know about sickle cell disease because I went in there you know 15 years ago and said I've got sickle cell disease they didn't know what sickle cell was but I had to tell them my friends know my family know but I still think that there's an element of you know even fatigue fatigue is a is a big problem in sickle cell I mean, fatigue is something I suffer from so badly at the moment, but I still don't think that people understand when I say I am tired, the kind of tiredness I'm talking about. I mean, Jenica and June, please elaborate on the question that Grace has, has answered because <laughs> I feel like I'm just blabbering. <laughs> no, I think I think you you touched on some important points, and one of them being that you know as people living with sickle cell it does affect us all different so to have such a general question of what what I could say people living with sickle cell need um first and foremost by you know healthcare professionals and people looking on is probably to say to be treated as individuals because what works for one doesn't always work for someone else and in that sense, I'm probably talking about treatments and the way we're looked after and cared for. But at the same time as well, it's looking at where, you know, looking at backgrounds. And I know obviously with, with this whole project, it's gone from, you know, generations ago up until today. Uh, different people's, you know, backgrounds, their makeups will have an impact on how they live with their sickle cell, how their sickle cell impacts them. They might come from a household which is very stressful. They might not even have a good support system. All of these things can have a different impact on how somebody is affected by sickle cell and how their sickle cell affects them. So I think just being aware that sickle cell affects everyone differently and that this should be looked at you know, as a, on an individual basis, and also looking at holistic methods as well. So it's not just about treatments, medications, it's also about mindfulness, it's also about health and well-being, and um, all of these things. And of course, the awareness, if, if we can speak some more about this, share more awareness about this, like June was saying, you know, if, if more people are aware about this, then they will be aware that Sometimes we have issues that you can't see, for example, fatigue, um, you know, some of the complications that we have, it is invisible. So I think all of those things would have to be a combination of, of, of the needs because it would be different for, for different people. Yeah, um, just, yeah, just very briefly, I, I agree with Laurel when Laurel said that a lot has happened in the last 
few years. Well, also my time, I'm, I'm not as old as Laurel, but I am old. <laughs> um, but um, I have seen quite good, um, significant change in the sickle world, especially around policy change, mostly driven by the sickle cell society, because I've been part of some of those conversations and part of those policy changes. So for example, we've had, um, it took sadly a girl to die in South London, a young woman rather, for the ambulance to change its policy around response times to people living with sickle cell from 30 minutes to eight minutes. And that involved patients and the society and doctors and nurses, the entire community coming together to really educate London Ambulance and the big wigs to say, this is not something that deserves to be put on the amber red light. And this is a serious condition. Someone's died as a result of the lack of response um, to health. I think there are so many changes that have been made, but there are still lots of improvements. Um, when you think about Sway, uh, the global survey with the Sickle Cell Society and what's happened across the UK and the world, two thirds of people living with sickle cells still say that they are dealing with major emotional and mental health trauma. And yet, especially our black men, and yet we don't talk about mental health and the traumas that come out from each crisis. And I think psychological support should be at the forefront of this disease. Um, because there are children dealing with very significant pain and suffering, and so are adults, and we don't really, we haven't really figured it out. I know, obviously, we've we now have hospital care and hematology care given specialist psychological support, but we need to talk about it more and raise awareness about how people really access support. Um, and I think there's something about bringing all the support groups together. Um, in the UK because there are really pockets of good practice across, you know, parts, I live in parts of London, we still have postcode lotteries, you know, where, you know, if I if I move out of London, am I, am I guaranteed to get the same care? Say I moved to Wales, for example, um, do, will I have specialist care? So there's all of that variation in care. And I think we're getting there. There's a lot of work being done on a policy level, a parliamentary, parliamentary level, advocacy level and I think there's there's still quite a lot of stuff to address so I think those are the top ones I would say that need a bit more work you you're all talking about uh, awareness which is an important factor I think raising more awareness and I think I explained at the beginning like how important it was to include uh, you know art uh, you know how art is important for you to raise awareness about sickle cell. I know Laura touched upon this, but maybe June, you want to talk about it, like the importance of art? Yeah, so um, I'm not an artist, but I, no, um, no. <laughs> I um, I'm a very creative person. I studied literature. So my, my area really is in writing and in poetry. And that's my main medium of expression. However, in 2019, I decided to really think about a different art form visually of how I could talk to the world about sickle cell in a very different way, because I always write about it and I always talk about it. And I thought there's something quite powerful with our sensory sort of the way we pick up things from the visual and the auditory. So I decided to go with photography, which is another art medium I'm really passionate about. And um, and really, I, I shot 40 portraits with people who have sickle cell from different backgrounds, different ages, um, to tell stories through um, just the visual, the things we can't see. So how do you narrate pain? How do you narrate suffering? How do you narrate mental health issues, frustration, isolation, those sort of sort of abstract things that we don't really connect with until we know the person's story or we've really connected with them. Um, so yeah, so I created these portraits with a team and um, just luckily there was a call for art for artists to 
really um, express what pain meant to them by Imperial, which Alinta also curated. And I was very opportune to have my work exhibited at Imperial College. But basically it's, I think personally for me, it's, it's a way of expressing and releasing the feelings that I have, whether it's by journaling or visual or painting or whatever. But I really wanted to change the narrative of how I can tell the story of sickle cell in a different way and help members of the public connect. What, what is this person trying to say? What are they feeling? What is this, what is this subject telling me? And I, I hope I did that. <laughs> Um, but I'm, I'm really happy with the way the project has gone. It's been globally um, looked at as well online through my website, but also um, I'm glad that I was able to exhibit through the BCA and also at Imperial College. And I've also been yeah, told that there are potential other opportunities to really show what sickle cell means to people visually. So it was a, it was really just stepping out of my comfort zone and trying to express in a different way and hoping I could connect visually with, with other people, but also trying to find meaning in what this pain and suffering means to me and others who were photographed through that project. And really, I just asked people to basically show what they meant in the context of their pain behind the camera. So I was really happy with the way that project went here. Yeah. Um, so we've got actually two questions in the comments. So um, one kind of touching on uh, something that Jean mentioned about how do you think how do you think the location of where people with sickle cell live affects their care, and do you think organisations could be doing more? That's from Sada Graham. Um, so, Jennifer, you're in Birmingham, aren't you? Um, maybe uh, if you'd like to, if you have anything to say about that, that'd be great. Yes, um, I think it's clear. I mean, I'm I'm born and raised in Birmingham. However, I've you know done work with the Sickle Cell Society before, and I work with a number of charities um, in Birmingham as well. And having that, you know the access to different cities, versatility, also becoming unwell in different places, it's clear that there is a, a there's a there's a change in the services that are available depending on where wherever you're located so i think as well as kind of the access to healthcare it's important that people also it's not just about healthcare but also support services so there are charities like oscar who were set up from 1974 and they've been supporting people living with sickle cell and thalassemia um, with their care and with you know more awareness and um, their treatments and things like that there have been you know specialized um, hemoglobinopathy services that are set up in different regions so the northeast west south of the uk coordinating centers and specialist teams but i think these individual pockets of um, organizations and teams that are being set up and are there to serve the purpose it's on one hand these are leaps and bounds in you know the progression and treatments of people living with sickle cell because these services are now set up however what then is requires more work I would say is what happens within the within these pockets um, and regions and organizations because how one center might be run for example in London Will be completely different to how it's run in Birmingham, Manchester and you know elsewhere. I think definitely something that um, Dame Elizabeth Anyanbu touched on earlier in saying that nurses you know they for their um, training they should be trained all nurses should be trained in sickle cell. That in itself is just so important because if you go outside of your local area like june said you know what happens if you are going to go to wales or wherever as soon as you step out of your your comfort zone your local area there's that fear of not everyone's going to know and that has happened uh to to me and many others that i've known where you end up somewhere and no one has a clue you know and so even though there's been excellent improvements we've got nice guidelines we've got all of these things in place there are still nurses that don't even understand what the nice guidelines mean what they are what's on them you know and then as patients with 
you know, as well as being in pain, are then educating people. So I think there's there's still a, there's a lot that's been done, as we've said, but there's a lot that there's a lot of work still to be done. And I don't know how we can try and bring all these services together, these things that are being created to ensure that what's happening within them is still having the, the impact that it needs to be having. Well, uh, thank you for coming uh, toward the end. I think we could have spoken with you like for like another uh, half an hour, half an hour. Uh, thank you again, uh, you know, for coming today and just contributing. I think it's really important. Uh, I, you know, it's, uh, the whole project is about oral history because I think the voice of people that are not necessarily heard. I mean, uh, June talked about invisibility. Uh, I think it is, it's really important to uh, weigh those voices because, as you say, there are so many differences. Uh, people are different. They experience sickle cell in a different manner. So I think that's what uh, is those, uh, I guess, the project uh, uh, is important. So really thank you. And uh, I will, uh, you know, well, um, ask you all if you want to uh, go on the website, visit the page, uh, listen to those testimonies, listen to, because there are so many issues uh, and so many issues raised uh, in the exhibition, uh, you know, we couldn't put everything. That was one of the biggest uh, challenge for us to try to, to and to be uh, also, uh, I guess the word is uh, to, to do justice to what people say, because it's, you know, people trust us with their, with their interviews. So that was a big challenge to, to select and to to make sure that it it was there. So I really encourage people if they want to know more, uh, if they want also to uh, you know to find more about you know how to help uh, to uh, join the Sickle Society or Oscar. There are so many organizations uh, in uh, in uh, you know in the UK working individual even on social media on Instagram. So I think it's really important. And again and. Uh, finally, thanks uh, to the BCA, the Black Cultural Archive. They've been amazing to work with because it's been a challenging, challenging year with the pandemic and they've been so uh, flexible. So I really have to give a shout out to them, uh, you know, and to the Heritage Autry Fund also. So thank you very much uh, and uh, thank you. So, uh, Tracy. I'm not sure if Arike is going to come back. Yeah, thank you, everyone.